Hey guys, it's David back here with another episode of the Cerebral Palsy and Fitness Podcast. Today I have Heather Hutchinson. She's a, a an author. She she her book is called Holding On by Letting Go, and she's also a singer songwriter who was actually born blind. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, feel, if you can if you can start, uh, feel free to share a bit about yourself and how you. I guess were you born with your disability or or was it yes to... I was born blind yeah okay so okay. genetics yeah did you have any any difficulties growing up when when you were a child you know I think the first few years I think probably it's the case for a lot of kids with disabilities you know you don't really realize you're different because your world is kind of pretty small when you're young so it's kind of, you know, I would hang out with my brother and my cousins and just do whatever they did. And nobody really said that I couldn't. And it was about the time that I entered elementary school that kids started treating me different. You know, people started being bullies and things like that. And that was really the first time that I kind of realized that I was different. And at that point, I kind of was self-aware enough to realize that even adults were you know, treating me differently. And that kind of caused a lot of anxiety. Oh, I, I can, I can imagine. And, and then just, um, I guess it's getting through, getting through school, um, trying to, I guess, meet people and uh, make friends was probably difficult for you. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. I had like a really awesome core group of friends, but there were definitely some, some challenges with other students and even teachers who, you know, didn't want to do the extra work to have me in their classes and things like that. It's more of, you know, you know, the funny thing is that when it comes to like the education system, sometimes it's uh, they tend to overlook someone with a disability because they assume that uh, just because physically they look different, there's something wrong with them, you know, mentally. And that's that's not the case. And and nowadays I'm kind of glad that slowly but surely we're becoming uh, more represented in, in, in like those, you know, government roles or being actors or, or, or even even you, you're a singer songwriter. So I'm pretty sure you're in a profession where you're severely underrepresented. You know, I'm yeah. pretty sure there's not very many out there. No, not not really. I don't I wouldn't say I know any personally for sure. So you're, you're out there breaking breaking that stigma you know, breaking the, uh, that glass ceiling of, Hey, you know, I, I maybe may have this, this, uh, this disability or this impairment, but I, I won't let it stop me from achieving what I want to achieve and my dreams and my goals. So that that's good for you. Good for yeah, you. I think, I think we can do it, you know, in small ways. Like it seems like with people with disabilities, either they're like, perceived as incredible or completely incapable and I kind of want to break that stereotype of like you can be somebody completely average with a disability like you don't have to it doesn't have to be one extreme or the other you don't have to be you know climbing Mount Everest or something like that to live a fulfilled life as somebody with a disability oh yeah you get that you get those moments where people uh praise you for doing some of those some of those most basic yes. things you know go picking yes. up the mail walking your dog you know going to work it's yeah like, it's normal stuff why, why do we have to like over over praise it or, or you know just it's normal stuff that we do every day as humans like yeah like, we don't need we don't need any of that you know yeah and we're not out there to be an inspiration to people we're just out there trying to live our lives I mean, I, I mean, I get the, I get, I get how they use inspiration sometimes, which is, there's, there's a time and a place for that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. But then there's like, like I said, the normal stuff that we do every day shouldn't be, you know, shouldn't be acknowledged. It's just stuff that we do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like the whole, wow, you're so amazing for getting up in the morning. Well, you know, not really. <laughs> I'll be like, hey, give me some gold stars. You know, I need some stickers. Can I get some stickers today? You know? Yeah, no kidding. Stickers yeah. would be awesome. You know? Yeah, yeah. I tend to, uh, I'm one of those people that if you give me like a, I guess, a snarky remark or something uh, regards to my disability, I tend to, to low-key, you know, sa savage, you know, be a low-key savage, but in a good way. You know, I don't yeah. try to, yeah. 
you know, I try, I try to be funny. So yeah, I'm the same way. Like, I think it's pointless to get mad at people and be like, oh, how could you ask that? Or, you know, how insensitive, but it's kind of fun to uh, almost try and beat them at their own game a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. And, you know, and we just have to keep moving forward as you as usual. So yeah, tell me a little bit about how you got into uh, singing and songwriting. How did you discover that? I think I was always super interested in singing and songwriting when I was a little kid. I had like one of those giant tape recorders that weighed like 10 pounds and I would carry it everywhere with me and just write songs and stories and dictate, you know, thoughts and all of that kind of thing. And as I kind of moved into my teen years and I was feeling more isolated, I turned to the piano and songwriting as a way to kind of sort through my own thoughts. And then I was in a regional talent competition and one of the judges on the panel for the finals actually came up to me after the show and said, you know, I'm a producer. We should look at doing some of your music. And I didn't really think that anything would actually come of it. But then three weeks later, I was in the recording studio, which was crazy because I was 15 at the time. So, you know, going from the high school band room to the recording studio in such a short amount of time was crazy. But it was really cool because then as I got out there more, as people listened to my music, as I met people at my shows and they'd be like oh you know this thing happened to me and this song really helped me or I can totally relate to this song because of because of this thing that I went through then it's kind of like that human connection right like right you know I'm writing these songs because I'm feeling these I'm feeling alone or whatever emotions and other people are feeling that too so it was really that kind of connection that brought people together and I think that's what's the most incredible thing about music is its ability to do that. That's awesome. H- have you been uh, featured anywhere that uh, that's been pretty prominent as far as your music? Um, yeah, I've done, you know, a lot of shows, a lot of um, TV, radio appearances um, for song or for performing, like singing songs and being interviewed and stuff. And it's been kind of challenging because of COVID. So there hasn't been a lot going on. Um, my last album won an award for a uh, pop recording of the year. So yeah, it's awesome. been, it's been really good. It's been quiet because of COVID, but I have done in the past quite a bit of, of performing like that in, in a lot of really cool places in, in, all the way from North America to South America. So. That's awesome. Did, did you, uh, I guess, when you first got into the industry, did you feel, I guess, tremendous pressure knowing that you have, you know, your disability and then you were, you're worried that people might, might judge you right off the bat? You know, it's funny, but with music, not really, because I would go into the recording studio and it just felt like it felt like I found my place in this world because all the musicians, I don't know what it was, but none of them treated me like I was different. They just treated me like an equal, like a girl who loved music. So in terms of like my peers or my my colleagues, no, not really. Sometimes, yeah, people in the public would make comments like people at shows and things like that. Um but I was really surrounded by this core group of of musicians and producers and engineers that just really treated me completely as an equal. So it was kind of easier to brush off the comments from the public. Yeah, that's um, that's what I typically do. I typically brush off any any comments and stuff, and or or I just you know I just uh, reply back with something kind, you know, like, you know, thank you for taking the time to at least read it and commenting, yeah. commenting on it, you know, just, just for the fact that you commented, uh, is going to give people, uh, more of a reason to watch, you know, yeah, yeah, or, exactly. to, or to listen. So, uh, and then I end it with like, ha- have a good day. And people, people will be just like under the comments, trying, trying to like, trying to be really mean. And I'm like, yo, don't, don't be mean to the person. I just, you know, just leave it alone leave it alone yeah yeah kill them but, with kindness <laughs> but but then you have you have those that are like go go over overboard with everything but you know yeah what can you do? yeah 
And it's super easy to do it online because it's so anonymous. It's so easy to write things from behind a keyboard that we would never say to somebody in person. So um, trying to think here. So in, in terms of, 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 your, of yourself, um, when, when, was it a, when was it a time that you, you said to yourself, you know, this is, this is me, this is who I am this is my, my disability. And I, I proudly accept myself. Like for myself, it took me until I was like 25 to be able to say, you know, this is my CP. I, I, I am who I am. I'm proud of who I am. And, and, and if people don't like it, then so be it, you know? Yeah. It's hard to get to that place. And I would say some days I'm better at it than others. I've come a long way from, you know, being, I think being a teenager with a disability is really challenging because there is so much peer pressure and so much um, desire, I guess, to fit in. And, you know, people are kind of, teenagers are mean. So they're kind of calling into question, well, you know, you can't do this with us because you have a disability or whatever. So I think, yeah, yeah, it kind of took me as well into adulthood. And sometimes, like I said, I'm better at it than others. There's some days when it just, you know, all gets to be a little much. And then, you know, you go to bed and the next day is better. So I don't think that there was like really a moment where I was like, okay, it's fine. And it's been fine ever since then. It's definitely gotten better with age because I think we get to a point where we don't quite care as much yeah. what other people think. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's something out there that we have to just uh, eventually pe- people are people are different. You know, people may find acceptance, you know, early, like in the teen years or people might wait till adulthood to be able to be accepted. Mm-hmm. And But the most important thing is, as long as we have a good support system, it makes the transition a whole lot easier. Yeah, yeah, it really does to have some people in your court that you can always count on who, you know, it does affect them too, though, even because, you know, I know for me, sometimes when I'm out in public with my partner or a friend or whatever, people will actually come up and like, thank them for taking care of me. (laughs) As in like, I don't know, I've hired them to be a caregiver or something. So they get some of that, you know, negative attention too. But if you have a really solid support network, they're gonna, you know, be okay with that as much as possible. And and want to support you through that, even if sometimes it gets awkward for them as well. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's it's one of those things that you have to kind of uh, overlook and just know because I, I deal I deal with a lot I deal with kids too because I'm a in my youth advocate so because it's funny because I know both sides pretty well because yeah. I know I know there's there's one mode you have to deal with when it comes to kids which is like you're educating them. And then when it comes to adults, it's completely different because adults tend to be harsher than kids. I mean, I get kids, kids are kids. They're going to say whatever, Yeah. but we are, our, our job is to kind of redirect them and to teach them early. So when they become adults, they don't decide to say something, something asinine, you know, and, and really offend, you know, whoever they're speaking to, or, you know, yeah. I have no idea. So, um, I, I tend to be, I tend to try to talk to the kids on their level. Yeah. So that they understand. And what I used to do when I was a kid was I would take each year of school. And on the first day of every year, I'd talk about my disability, like right up the front. Yeah, so, I did that too. <laughs> so, so that, so that way during, during the school year, um, the, I guess the impact of like bullying and just feeling like you're yeah. by yourself was a whole lot less. Yeah. Yeah. And some kids will get it. And unfortunately some won't, but you definitely, yeah, it's good. I think as a kid to learn early to advocate for yourself in that way and to, you know, do those presentations and be like, yeah, this is me ask whatever you want to ask and then let's move on. Yeah. That's that's all, that's all you can do. Like now, now as an adult, like I, I, you know, I've dealt with with a lot of kids and some of them are, some of them can be pretty, pretty brutal as far as like what they want to say about you. Like I had a, a couple of years ago, I had students that were in my, in my classroom, they would, they would low key uh, talk behind my back. And so I'd come back and be like, be like, you're, you're so busy running your mouth. What about that zero you have in the grade book right now? 
<laughs> and the whole, the, whole, the, whole class, the, the whole class is like the whole class is stopped for a moment they're like and this is just sort of laughing at the students they're like oh mr mr david just came back at you with uh something pretty something pretty big over there yeah that's awesome yeah so, and hopefully they'll think twice before they do it again yeah so i i'm that kind of person i like to have fun with fun with it you know yeah i don't let yeah. it bother me yeah. No, I agree. I think sometimes it can it can get to the point where it is bothersome and then you just kind of have to be like, no, okay, I'm going to have fun with this. Yeah, just like, you know, uh, well, it's too short to be uh, be thinking negatively because somebody said something, an off comment about you, you know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And it doesn't help us to keep dwelling on it. Yeah, I just I just thank them for it because it's, it's one more reason for them to, to look to look really really dumb you know <laughs> yeah exactly sometimes it's kind of fun to like if somebody asks a really stupid question like people ask me were you born like that and I like to be like like what and it makes them super uncomfortable and it makes them stop and think <laughs> hmm, maybe I shouldn't be asking that question of somebody I've never even met before yeah yeah it's uh what can you do right yeah <laughs> So, um, in regards to, I guess, your, what about your, your book? Tell me a little bit about it. How'd you, what, what inspired you to write your book and, uh, get it out there, that message? Yeah. So my book kind of chronicles my life as a blind person in Canada and Latin America. And there's kind of this parallel theme of the struggles I've had with my mental health since I was really young, which ultimately culminated in me being hospitalized for psychiatric care at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, which was, you know, kind of challenging because of all the things that were going on in the hospital at the same time, you know, there were no visitors allowed, there were extra precautions and protocols and things like that. And it was when I was in the hospital that I kind of really realized, you know, there are people in here who are fighting to live and I'm, you know, fighting to, to not live because I didn't want to do it anymore. And it really made me realize I have a choice and these people might not. Right. And if I have this choice, if I can do something, if I can move forward, if I can get out of the hospital and get better, then I need to do something positive with a really negative, difficult situation. And, you know, the, the thought for me of somebody else going through what I went through was honestly the most painful part of what I went through. So I thought if I can write this story and it helps one person to not go through this, then it's totally worth, you know, fighting to, to get better and to get out of here. So I can tell my story. Right. It's, it's really important to, um, get out there and make people aware that, um, that mental health is a, a serious thing that we need to address. And it seems like it's, it's getting more and more prevalent each and every day with what's going on, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Which is really great. And I think people are, you know, with social media, people are talking about it a little bit more. Um, I would like to see people talk about it more in depth because I think when people are really going through it, sometimes the social media posts can actually be even more isolating because people are just like, oh, you know, I went through this thing, but, but I'm all better now. And as somebody, when you're actually going through it, it's kind of like, okay, well, good for them. But, but what does that actually look like? Like sometimes I think sharing our own darkness can actually be the light that guides somebody else through theirs. So instead of glossing over it, you know, really tell people what it was like. Yeah. And, and, and it, it also, you have to think that a lot of people think mental health is just, they think it's just a phase, you know, like, oh, oh, like mm-hmm. you're, you're sad about something. Okay. Yeah. Just, just move on. Uh, uh, that man up or, 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 you know, mm-hmm. just don't be upset anymore. It's, it's nothing to deal. It's nothing to no, no big deal. You know, I'm like, I'm like, it's no big deal to you, but to somebody yeah. else it might be, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I think when we're kids, that's, I hope it's changing. But when I was growing up, it was totally just this, like, oh, she'll grow out of it. It's just a phase kind of thing. And instead of giving the kids the treatment that they need, they just hope that they'll grow out of it. And when they don't, 
the mental health struggles just become all the more difficult to treat the older you get. So I think it's really important to take that seriously when kids are young and, and get them into treatment, get them the help they need so that they're not dealing with this into adulthood. Right. I, I totally, I totally agree with you on that. It's, it's uh, really important that we, we should address it, especially with our, with our gener- the generation now it's coming up because now with social media, uh, I feel like dealing with mental health and mental health in general has gotten a lot worse. Yeah. You know, it's gotten way worse because now, now kids are, have, they have easier access to, to, to everything, to, to, to videos, to, 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 to screenshots, to uh, even bullying, you know, mm-hmm. even bullying their, 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 whoever they're bullying. It's, it's so easy now. It's, yeah. It's, cyber it's bullying. It's yeah. horrible. Yeah. 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 And even, you know, the amount of time they spend on Instagram looking at these perfect, perfectly curated lives that just aren't real. But these kids are seeing that and thinking, well, why is my life not like that? But the truth is nobody's life is like that. They've just done a really good job of, you know, presenting this image, this brand to people that they have the perfect life and that, you know, they look perfect. They put all these filters on and these young kids are going well my life's not like that there must be something wrong with me yeah if you, if you think about Emil Durkheim's uh front stage backstage uh theory uh he addresses how people are how people have two different two different characters so you have your your backstage which is which is you you as a person you know your personality then you have a front stage which is like the stage you put on at work or for example mm-hmm. when you're singing uh, thing, things like that, you know, and these kids, when they go on Instagram and they front, you know, their cars or the watches or their money, hey, that's, that's their, that's their front stage. That's, that's, that's them trying to show out when, when in reality, people don't really know, don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. Because we get behind the scenes, it could be a complete mess. You know? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nobody's life is together as, is as together as it looks on Instagram. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. And I hope uh, down the line, there'd be more people advocating out there for, for mental health. Like right now I'm, I'm recently, I just recently got signed to a, uh, to, to Titan fitness, a fitness ambassadorship. So I'm actually a fitness ambassador for the company and they actually actually help promote mental health awareness. That's why, that's why I kind of signed with them Yeah, because of what they're doing with the, with the brand itself. Yeah. That's awesome. It's just so important. We need to be seeing it and hearing about it from all sides. So I think it's really important when, when brands kind of take that on. Yeah, we need, we need more of that for sure. Um, where, where can we find like more information about, about you, your, your book and, and about you in general? You can visit my website at www.heather-hutchison.com, H-U-T-C-H-I-S-O-N. And on there, there's links to all my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, there's links to my music on Spotify, Apple Music, basically anywhere you listen to music. And my book is on there as well. There's links to Amazon, uh, Audible. It's an audiobook as well. It's available in print, ebook, and audiobook. And yeah, there's just more, more information about me on on my websites and on social media so it would be great to connect awesome so i'll definitely uh share all that when the episode's released um and i definitely had a had a blast having you on today Learn, thank you so about much you and your journey thanks and, for um, having me yeah and to kind of end the episode what what kind of advice would you give uh, those that are dealing with uh i guess uh mental mental health uh mental health situations right now that are going through some tough times Yeah, I think it's important not to offer empty platitudes like, oh, cheer up, tomorrow's another day. It's not that big a deal. Because I know when I was going through it, people would say that to me and that would be the exact moment that I would stop listening to them because I'd be like, you just don't get it. But what I can promise people is that there will come a day where you'll stop in a moment and you'll feel so much joy and you'll think to yourself, you know, if I had succumbed to the mental health struggles I was going through before, 
I would have missed this. So I just really hope that you will hang on for that day because it's totally worth it. That that is that is an awesome message. I, I completely agree with you, and um, I hope they. I hope a lot of people listen to this and they think you know, it, life life isn't life isn't something to throw away. It's something really precious, and and with uh, and as long as I have a great support system and people out there to help me, I'll be able to make it through anything. Yeah, yeah, you will get through it. I know there's times where it feels like you can't even get through the next minute or the next hour, but you know, somehow we do. All right. So uh, you'll be able to find this episode on, on Spotify, iTunes, on YouTube, and other major podcasting outlets. And I appreciate you guys for listening today. Uh, thank you once again, Heather, for being on. Thank you. And I hope you guys take care and I will see you on the next one.